All right, here we are again for lecture 39. We're moving along. So, uh, and today we're going to talk about again something another uh, another subject that is also dear to my heart as a sociologist and somebody who's interested in studying social movements, and that is the progressive movement that took place in the very late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, and uh, this is a really, really complex, complicated um, uh, movement. And the reason why it's such a huge and complex uh, movement is because there are so many facets to it. There, there's so many different groups that are kind of doing somewhat the same thing, uh, but they're not necessarily speaking in the same voice and even necessarily agreeing with each other in some of these issues. So the progressive movement becomes something that's very, very difficult to, to grasp for a lot of students and to understand. Um, and another thing that tends to get a little bit confusing is that the progressive movement is still in existence and still has something to say. Uh, and yet um, the progressive movement today is a little bit, well, it's significantly more co uh, cohesive um, and unified than was the progressive movement of the early 20th century. And so many of the things that the progressives of the early 20th century uh, agreed with and uh, pursued, uh, things that the modern progressives have kind of abandoned um, as being flawed or, or even, you know, impractical or immoral. So, um, so if we try, if we conflate uh, contemporary progressivism with the progressivism that existed in the early 20th century, yeah, there's a lot of parallels, but there's also some uh, a lot of room to go wrong. So uh, I'm going to try to be as concise as I possibly can with this particular lecture. This is something that that uh, we could spend an hour or two uh, lecturing on, and I'm sure that that's not what you want to hear when you turn on these uh, turn on these videos. So uh, I'll, I'll do the best I can. I don't know how long this is going to take, but I'll do the best I can. All right. So, moving along here, uh, the essential question, analyze the factors contributing to the rise and the fall of the progressive movement. Um, and exactly what is the progressive movement? Well, the progressive movement is very difficult to define in many ways. Um, but suffice it to say that the progressive movement was actually a collaborate, well, I don't know necessarily, um, uh, kind of a, um, a, a um, almost a collaboration, not even quite a collaboration, but in essence, it was a movement in which, um, it, which describes many movements uh, that were all kind of moving in the same direction. So I don't even really want to say collaboration because many of these groups weren't in fact collaborating. Some of the things, some of the goals that one particular progressive group had uh, was oftentimes in conflict with what other progressive groups wanted to see happening. So, um, but they all did share some certain commonalities. So when we take, talk about the progressive movement, it's probably better to talk about progressive movements um, and understand that they largely had similar goals. So, um, so first, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, these progressive reforms, they wanted to see changes in the government. They wanted to reform the government. They believed that the government had become corrupt, that it had become largely answerable to, to uh, big business interests and, and big money, and they wanted to make the government more um, uh, amenable and more answerable to the people, quote, the quote-unquote people. Um, did they want more democracy? Well, to a certain extent, um, the progressives were certainly looking for a more democratic society, a more democratic uh, nation. Uh, in other regards, they, there were progressives who weren't necessarily as democratic as others. Uh, this is going to create some issues with regard to democracy. Uh, secondly, the, uh, the progressives wanted to curb the power and the influence of the trusts, the big businesses of that time, uh, that were wielding a tremendous amount of power. So right off the bat, we're kind of seeing um, an evolution similar to what the populists were, were going at. Many of these, uh, these uh, progressives of the early 20th century are, in fact, uh, the old populists of the late 19th century. They kind of moved over. Um, the... Um, the progressives were also very interested in moral improvement, and this is, is related to this idea of self-improvement that, that, that came about in the 19th century. Um, people, especially middle class people, uh, working toward making themselves better individuals. Uh, well, now we're actually going to say uh, maybe there should be a, li a larger social movement toward this end. And uh, finally, the, the progressives were very much into science and, and the development of scientific innovations to help improve society. Um, so now, what was the common element here? Now, all of, there's a, th this could be describing a lot of different groups, uh, very diverse groups, from labor unions to uh, temperance movements and women's suffrage to civil rights. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, 
um, you know, overlap here. What, what exactly is the common element of these, uh, of these progressives and the goals that they wanted to achieve? And the goals that they wanted to achieve is uh, the, they wanted to achieve these reforms through the government. Uh, they felt that these reforms were in the government domain. That, um, that if, a, if the government really is a representative government, that it should represent all of the people, and therefore these reforms should be, uh, you know, the government should be pressured to, add, to include these reforms. They were looking for legal reforms, and in some cases, constitutional reforms. So according to, uh, to uh, the textbook Liberty, Equality, and Power by Morin et al., um, they summarized the progressives in this way. Progressives wanted to rid politics of corruption, Tame the power of the trust and in the process inject more liberty into American life. They fought against prostitution, gambling, drinking, and other forms of vice. All of which is true. Um, and again, there's a lot of stuff going on here, and it's difficult to see the progressives as being just one movement to draw, uh, pushing its way forward. There were many influences on the progressive movement at this time. For instance, the 19th century was a time in which uh, a concept known as the social gospel was very prominent and very uh, and very popular, and this was the ideas. Uh, again, uh, a lot of this was coming out of the, this brand new uh, and growing and flourishing middle class, uh, in which the middle class uh, believed that it was important to spend at least part of your leisure time uh, working on improving the living conditions of uh, less fortunate people. Uh, again, this this somewhat comes out of the Protestant ethic. Um, that was very popular at the time as well. So this was the idea of the social gospel. It also kind of relates uh, when we talk about um, Andrew Carnegie, for instance, and his, uh, and his gospel of wealth. There's re reference to the gospel of wealth um, in which it, it just becomes incumbent upon those who are better off to help those who are not as well off. Um, the, um, inf the progressive movement was influenced by earlier uh, social movements and earlier forms of agitation, such as the agitation that was coming from the labor movements, the labor strikes, uh, the uprising of 1877, the Pullman strike, etc. Um, and also the agitation that was the result of the populist movement that was taking place in the late 19th century. These are also going to tie in, and these are going to become the strategy for progressives to help try to push their, uh, their agenda along. And also the, uh, the progressives were influenced by these new innovations of science. We talked about the, um, uh, the, 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 the World's Fair, 1876, the, the World Expo. Um, in which people came from all around to look at technological and share technological innovations from all over the world. This was something that was very, very influential to the progressives. They truly believed that um, science and technology could improve lives for everybody, um, and therefore there should be a, a social investment in science and technology and ways to make sure that everybody gets access to this uh, science and technology. So, uh, and also we have some unifying themes uh, that were, that, that took all of these, all of these groups um, and kind of gave them a similar, kind of a similar voice, even though they, they were oftentimes coming from very different directions. Um, all of these groups uh, were angry over economic injustice and they, they fought, they sought to fight economic injustice and this huge gap between the wealthy and the poor, um, and, but necessarily coming at it from different angles. Um, this was a huge demand for direct government action in the lives of individuals, and this is really uh, the, the first time we, 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 well, the populists are really the first time, but the, the progressives are going to really kind of bring this demand for government intervention into, into the lives of ordinary citizens uh, to a whole new level. Now, we've already seen where there's some, uh, there's some precedent for this, for, such as the Civil War. And such as the uh, Interstate Commerce Act and, uh, and, and things along those lines. So we already know that, there, that government can have a direct impact and a direct uh, influence on, uh, on everybody else. Now what we want to do is we want to enshrine this as a responsibility of government to help individuals out. And also, um, this, the pro progressive movement was kind of a communal movement. It was an idea that, that rejected the notions of, uh, of American individualism and especially social Darwinism, this idea of, um, you know, of uh, we make our, we're the self-made men, according to the, uh, and, and the fit survive and thrive. Uh, the, the progressives wanted to see the nation and these communities working together as a, as a community, as a state, and ultimately as a nation. Uh, 
to create reforms uh, to make life better for everyone rather than just kind of every man for himself. So to a certain extent, the progressive movement was a rejection of the individual, the, this, you know, this age-old tradition of American individualism. Um, and largely to a certain extent is, uh, remains that. Uh, we can kind of see that in this, uh, we can kind of see some of this anger uh, in this uh, political cartoon here uh, showing uh, John D. Rockefeller and um, what he's doing and what he's, he's here he's holding the White House and stuffing it full of money. And if you kind of look in the background here, you see the Capitol building and uh, out of the Capitol building are all these smokestacks and iron uh, and, I'm sorry, uh, oil refineries that just kind of emerge and kind of giving the indication that, that um, you know, pretty much the government has become uh, Rockefeller's plaything, and what we, what we want to do is we want to uh, take that power away from the Rockefellers and the and the Morgans, and kind of bring it back into the into the hands of everyday people. Um, so what we're going to do with today is we're going to talk a little bit about the um, the origins of progressivism, and we're going to talk about uh, progressivism is going to become a huge movement, uh, much more successful to, to a certain extent than the populist movement, even though we could kind of say that a lot of this is, a, is an extension of the populist movement. Uh, today we're going to, uh, today's lecture we're going to talk about um, some of the early um, influences on progressivism, and we're also going to talk about some municipal reforms and state reforms. Uh, in the next lecture we're going to talk about progressivism at the national level, and even uh, progressivism influencing presidential politics. Uh, in the early 20th century. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but anyway, before we get started really talking about the, uh, the progressive movement, we also have to understand that uh, during this time, there was, uh, there was a, a greater um, emphasis on print media. Uh, more people were, were able to read, and uh, newspapers and magazines were cheaper to make than they ever were before. And this was bringing information into the hands of people in, in ways that, that, that had never happened before. Um, so we're going to get this brand new breed of, uh, of journalists. This is really the, the, the opening stages of, of the professional journalism that we, know, that we know of today. These are folks who wanted to go in and they wanted to investigate a situation and they wanted to, uh, to kind of draw out the, uh, the slimy underbelly of capitalism, so to speak, and, um, and identify areas where there's corruption and, where, and, and really draw this out. So we're, see, so we're seeing the beginnings of, of real good investigative journalism. Um, and these folks were uh, known as the muckrakers. Now, they were referred to muck, as muckrakers by Teddy Roosevelt, who kind of sneered at the press uh, and was trying to insult them. But the, uh, the muckrakers are actually going to kind of embrace this, this title of, uh, of journalists out there raking up the muck to see, what, to see what, how, many, how many of our public officials and our, uh, you know, can we pull out of the, uh, out of the muck. So these were the muckrakers. The muckrakers were, in essence, investigative reporters who were reporting on government and, uh, and corporate corruption. And um, some of their influences, of course, we've already seen this with, uh, with the fall of Tammany Hall and, uh, and the breakup of the Tweed Ring. Where uh, where Thomas Nast, the cartoonist, just kept uh, you know kept hitting and kept striking at uh, at Boss Tweed until ultimately he was indicted. This is this kind of became an inspiration for other journalists to follow suit and to follow into these footsteps. It was great stuff. Also during this time, we see um, we see that there's um, that there's an emphasis on an artistic movement called realism, and the goal was to uh, to uh, this was a, a literary and artistic movement during the time, and the goal was to present uh, everyday life in as realistic a fashion as possible, war, warts and all, so to speak. And these journalists, instead of creating these fluff pieces about how wonderful life was, uh, they wanted to actually see well, what, how true is that. So you get guys like uh, like this fellow here, one of our first and greatest photojournalists, uh, Jacob Rias. And, um, and he's going all along the city and he's taking pictures of what life was like in the city. So this is a, this is a really good example here. Um, this is an image of children, oops, let me see if I can move this around here, of children uh, sleeping in the streets. They're sleeping in like a, a little dugout in the streets of, um, uh, of New York City. Uh, you can kind of see that these are kids who are, who are looking kind of scared, uh, desperate folks. This is not something that we, these aren't kids just playing in the street having a good time, right? And uh, many of his photographs kind of brought that, the, this idea of, uh, of looking at how the other half lives. And now we got these photographs. Photo, photography was a, was a huge influence on, on the realism movement. And we're actually looking at photographs of, of everyday life. 
And um, once we see photographs of it, we, we have to deal with it. We have to see that we have to, uh, um, you know, we have to incorporate this into our lives. And how do we incorporate into our lives uh, children sleeping in the streets without coming and saying, uh, making a stand on that? Either saying that this isn't right, we should do something, or this isn't right, and oh well, or this, this isn't right, or this is perfectly justifiable. Those kids are poor. They're simply not going to survive. It is what it is. Um, so we, we have to make a stand once we actually see these pictures. Also, the economic realities were the, um, that, uh, that this kind of journalism sold advertising space. So, uh, so newspapers were a lot cheaper to print. Magazines were a lot cheaper to print. They reached a further audience, which meant more money for advertising space. So people would pay to read, say, Ida Tarbell and her expose on Standard Oil, because everybody was impacted by Standard Oil. And uh, when you go after them, people are going to read that. Uh, Upton Sinclair, in his famous book, The Jungle, uh, which was actually a book about uh, the plight of immigrants living in Chicago. But um, actually, it ended up that, the, uh, that people read the book and couldn't care less about the immigrants, but they were really upset about what was going on in the meat factories. You mean I'm eating that stuff? Ooh, something needs to change. We have to do something about, well, yeah, yeah, what about the immigrants? But, but, but my meat isn't, uh, isn't pure, and I really would rather not eat that. Um, so these are all examples of muckrakers and some of the things that the muckrakers are doing and calling attention to some of these social injustices. And once you call attention to these injustices, so you've got to do something about it. Women also played a huge role in the progressive movement. It was oftentimes women who were participating in this social gospel movement, this, um, whereas men were going off, middle class men were going off and, and quote unquote bringing home the bacon, so to speak. Um, middle class women were often, if they had some leisure time, they were dedicating that to social causes. Um, and these causes are going to grow and become more and more significant in, in, uh, in life. Um, one of these movements, of course, was the settlement house movement. This was a movement in which uh, immigrants would go to settlement houses. Well, immigrants and the poor could go to settlement houses uh, in cities and get help, get assistance, get training, um, get a place to sleep and a place to, maybe a place to live, at least temporarily, get education, learn how to speak English. Um, learn how to sew and make clothing and things along those lines. You just kind of get access to, to uh, child care while they're away at work. And these were all uh, services that these settlement houses uh, would provide. Of course, the most famous of the settlement houses was that uh, founded, uh, uh, called, uh, I don't know what to say, founded by Jane Addams, but certainly, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, promoted by Jane Addams, and Jane Addams became associated with this house. She was a sociologist working in... Uh, in um, in what was called Hull House in Chicago, and uh, also Florence Kelly was a, was also a, a member of Hull House and a very very important uh, female activist at this time. So um, so they're per, they're front and center in the plight against um, against poverty and uh, and injustice. And when you see it happening every day, uh, you have to do something about it. You have to make a stand. Um, also, too, uh, women found themselves involved in moral issues, socially moral issues. For instance, the fight against prostitution. Oftentimes, in the, uh, in the, especially in urban centers, women were facing uh, you know, poor women were facing the prospects of either um, working hor under horrible conditions in the factories, making almost nothing as far for wages, or prostituting themselves. And consequently, uh, many of them were choosing prostituting themselves. It was, uh, it was, um, yeah, it's bad, but it wasn't necessarily as bad as working in the factories. And oftentimes, uh, women were subject to abuse and uh, and sexual assault in these factories. So, um, so to a certain extent, the prostitution was, according to many women at this time, um, a better option for them. Considering, um, so we have to put into effect, uh, try to put into effect rules and regulations to kind of limit and and uh, campaign against um, uh, prostitution. Also, uh, alcohol. Alcohol was a huge women's movement, a part of the women's movement, and part of the domestic movement of that time. And if you think about it as a women's, uh, temperance as a women's issue, the idea of temperance was to make it illegal to drink alcohol, to, to, to ban alcohol, ban the sale of alcohol. And, um, 
And these were, you know, you have these men who are working in the coal mines for, or, or in the iron mills, the smelting mills or whatever. Uh, they're working 10, 12, 14 hours a day and they come out of the mills, uh, they get their paycheck and oftentimes what these, what these men want to do is they don't want to be involved. They don't want to have any other responsibilities than they've had in the factories. They're just going to go and they're going to go and kind of escape in the bars and the pubs that are waiting outside of the... Uh, uh, of the um, uh, of the factories, and they're spending their money in the bars and the pubs. Now, if they're spending their money in the bars and the pubs, they're all, they're not spending their money at home. Uh, they are also drinking, and drinking alcohol, we know, tends to lead to bad decision making and oftentimes to aggression. So these men were coming home from the bars drunk, and they're putting financial stress on their families, and ultimately there's high rates of uh, domestic violence and, uh, and things along those lines, and, and child abuse and that kind of thing. So alcohol was a really, really bad problem in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and there was these huge movements led by women during this time to try to kind of bring, get alcohol under control, and this was the temperance movement. We also have a fascinating figure, Ida B. Wells here. Uh, she was a, an African-American woman and a very important, I guess you would call her a muckraker, a, uh, a, uh, a journalist. And she went out and she, she made her claim to fame by, um, by investigating lynchings uh, that were going down, especially in the South. This was the, I guess, I don't want to say golden age of lynching. Um, to, for all that propounds, but, but lynching was a very popular way of keeping African Americans under control in the South. And, um, and this wasn't a matter of protecting, uh, especially protecting white women or th that kind of, this was just a matter of keeping black people in their place by using threat and terrorism and, uh, and violence. Uh, and she wrote an, expert, uh, an expose called The Lynch Law, um, exposing the, uh, the horrors of, uh, of lynching. And, um, also another uh, fascinating woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Um, she was uh, one of our very first women who was advocating for birth control and family planning and um, uh, for not using the baby-making process as a means of, of controlling and, um, and suppressing women, that women should be able to make choices with regard to whether or not they have children uh, and, and, the si and limiting the sizes of their families. Um, and so she, she was also, she was very much a controversial uh, uh, figure. Much of the literature that she um, produced was actually illegal to mail because of something called the Comstock Laws uh, that made it illegal to, uh, to um, send licentious in, you know, information through the mail, um, especially when somebody's talking about things like birth control. Uh, Margaret saying, and also we kind of see here some uh, some issues. For instance, um, unions were definitely a part of the progressive movement, uh, clearly, but um, obviously union members are not going to really have much to say about uh, temperance. They're not going to like the idea of not being able to drink. Uh, so we actually are going to see some conflicts between the, the women's movements and um, and the um, and the temperance movement. So this is an example of how not all progressives necessarily saw eye to eye. Of course, uh, southern progressives are going to uh, also be just as invested in segregation um, as uh, as southern non-progressives, and they're going to have a problem with Ida Bell, Ida Wells' uh, expose on lynching. So again, we're seeing that the progressive movement uh, there's some conflicts in the prog within the progressive movement itself, um, let, let alone Margaret Sanger. Um, Socialism is going to play a huge role in the progressive movement. Uh, the, uh, the socialists are pretty much your foremost uh, group for uh, advocating for uh, economic equality and economic justice. It was the, uh, the socialists, and of course there's, there's, you can't speak about socialists as, as speaking in one voice, uh, but the socialists largely felt that many of the factors of production need to be, um, need to be owned by the public. Uh, they don't need to be owned by private individuals, that they need to be owned uh, by the people, and of course the state is our representative. So um, according to many socialists, the state should own certain things like transportation, uh, railroads, uh, telegraphs, telephone lines, things along those lines. Things that exist, uh, yes, they, they're ways of making money, but they also exist for the public good, and they should be run for the public good. Uh, the socialists believe that, that, um, that what we needed to have was we, we needed to have uh, the state stepping in and making sure that the wealth that's being produced in the nation is being distributed more equally and more evenly. Now, not all soci socialists were saying that everybody should have an equal income, although some were. Um, not all uh, socialists were saying that there shouldn't be any rich people, although some were. 
Uh, but they were saying that the wealth of the society should be better distributed and that it is largely the responsibility of the government to make sure that that happens. Uh, so the goal of many of these socialists was to basically to overthrow capitalism to a certain extent. Um, and, um, and this is really not going to be necessarily the focus for many progressives. So, um, so this is the definition of socialism. Their, their emphasis is on economic inequality. And this was becoming a very, very popular movement. It was becoming a very, very popular movement, uh, especially within the labor movement. Uh, the socialism uh, emphasized the uh, you know, labor forces uh, by using strikes and boycotts and sit-ins and things along those lines of trying to get their way. And the bottom line is, is it's the workers who actually make the stuff that generates the wealth within society. And if the workers just simply stop doing that and refuse to participate, then they can actually assert some power over those who are the investor class or the capitalist class uh, who reaps most of the benefits from, from their production. So uh, a famous figure like this is Eugene Debs. Of course, we talked about Eugene Debs before. He was one of the uh, organizers of the, uh, the Pullman strike. He was arrested. He spent some time in prison. And while he was in prison, he read socialist literature and uh, emerged from prison as a socialist and a founding member of the Socialist Party of the United States. He would even run for president multiple times as a socialist. Um, and in fact, uh, the socialists would oftentimes get somewhere in and around of a million votes uh, running for president. So, um, so Eugene Debs was a pretty important, uh, pretty important guy. We're going to talk about him a little bit more uh, as we go along. Uh, Socialist Party of, of America, uh, not of American, but of America, uh, was, a, was a major political force. And also another group called the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, this was uh, the idea of the industrial workers of the world was to create one giant union of all of the industrial workers in the world. Um, and that way there what we would end up having is uh, we would have organized strikes and organized labor dissent, not just, uh, uh, you know, among uh, railroad workers or steel mill workers, but, uh, but everybody. So if something was happening to the railroad workers, all of the workers would go on strike. Railroad, steel, um, coal miners, everybody, all over the world. And that puts pressure on those folks to, you know, the, the, you know, the coal miners or the, the railroad owners to kind of give in uh, to what the workers were looking for. And that was kind of the goal of the IWW. We never actually achieved that goal. The IWW is still around, um, and they're still uh, talking about many of the same things. Uh, and we, we can kind of see what, this is a poster for the uh, the IWW, and you see this working man, uh, you know, rising out of this kind of uh, you know cityscape, this industrial uh, you know dystopia in the background, and and uh, making his way out of that. Uh, so this is the idea behind the uh, IWW. Now, uh, one of the things that we can say about the social the socialist uh, inspired a great deal of progressive thought and of the idea of of kind of making sure that everybody has an equal shot or leveling the playing field for the little guy. Um, one of the things that the socialists did was, uh, since the socialists tended to be a lot more radical and a lot more, um, you know, feisty with regard to uh, with regard to economics, and actually sought to overthrow capitalism uh, and institute a more of a, a more well a more socialist system, um, this was kind of scary to a lot of people. And uh, most of the progressives were not saying that. Most of the progressives were perfectly happy with capitalism. They just wished it was a little bit more fair. Um, so when you have socialists running around and they're getting over, over a million votes uh, for their presidential candidates and they're electing people at, to, at the state level and at the uh, national level, um, after a while a lot of the folks in the power elite are saying, hey, maybe we need to listen to what some of these progressives are talking about because the alternative uh, to listening to the progressives might be pushing more people into the, Amer the Socialist Party of America or the IWW where they could do a heck of a lot more damage. So to a certain extent, uh, the socialists is kind of promoting this idea of uh, uh, damage control. Actually, is that they're going to kind of push people into uh, negotiating a little bit more and giving in a little bit more to the progressives. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next, uh, in the next lecture. Uh, now, real quick, municipal report, uh, reforms. These are uh, municipal reforms are reforms that happen at the, at the local level, at the city level, uh, where city councils actually step in and they, they start making, uh, they make their own reforms and put them together at the, just at their local level. It doesn't have a state impact. And as you can see, uh, this is an image of one of the slums, 
in New York City, and you can kind of see these dilapidated living conditions and, uh, and you know, real, real bad uh, uh, situation here. And it is clear that the city needs some attention. That this kind of situation is not just immoral and inhumane to have people living like that, but it's also unsafe. You can imagine uh, what would happen if there was a little fire. Uh, or the diseases that are going to develop in this area. Something needs to be done at the city level. Um, so oftentimes what the problem, one of the things that we identified as, as being a problem was, well, uh, private owners uh, owned the utilities in many of the cities, and oftentimes they held a monopoly over these. So, uh, so for instance, trolley cars or electricity. Um, and uh, so what a lot of uh, progressives said is, hey, why don't we have the city own uh, the utilities, and instead of uh, in, instead of paying these exorbitant rates to um, to private companies, we'll pay uh, uh, you know uh, we'll pay utility bills to the to the city. And if, uh, if if they get expensive, then we just vote those guys out. We put people in there who are going to lower the rates a little bit. Um, so this is one of our prog uh, progressive reforms at the municipal level: the the city or public ownership of utilities. Um, also, too. The progressives at the city level like this idea of a, what was called the city management plan. Management plan. And what, the, um, what the, the idea of city management was is uh, instead of having a mayor who was in charge of the city, what the city would do is they would elect a commission. So each one of the boroughs would elect somebody to represent them in a, in a, uh, uh, in a, city, in a city council. And then they would have what was called the city, com uh, uh, the city management plan. Uh, this is the city commission plan. They would have what was called the city management idea. And this was the, the council would get together and they would find somebody who was a real expert in, in uh, um, you know, urban, urban planning and city dynamics and things along those lines. And they would hire him. He was not elected officially. He was somebody hired by the city council to, uh, to pretty much run the city. Um, so this was, and this kind of ties into that progressive belief in science and scientific management and the, the uh, idea of hiring experts uh, to, come to run things, but it's not necessarily a democratic idea. Um, and in fact, in many cases, the, uh, because the city council system oftentimes disenfranchised, especially minority voters, uh, you would have uh, the minority district would get one representative and then all the other white districts would get one representative and you would have one uh, minority sitting on a, on a council of five or six other uh, white councilmen and they would always get voted down. So sometimes it actually uh, hurt the democratic process in these municipal cities. However, it did oftentimes lead to improvements in efficiency and um, and uh, improvements in, in conditions such as this. Um, we also have reforms that were taking place at the state level, such as um, uh, democratic reforms, such as the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. Uh, these were, this was a case where um, an initiative was a, was a case where the people could get together and vote for the laws that they wanted to put in, rather than going through a legislative process. Um, they could actually, uh, they could actually vote for a law that they want, even if it can't necessarily get through their state legislature, and then, then, then that law would become a law. Also, the referendum process in which uh, they could actually add amendments to their own state constitutions through referendum. Uh, we also have recalls, and recalls, some states uh, have recalls, um, in which uh, if we, we elect a guy and then it turns out that he's not following through with the things he said he was going to follow through, we don't have to wait until the next election year to get rid of the joker. We can have a recall election and we can get rid of him uh, right then and there. Um, so these are all ways of kind of building up um, democracy at the state level, and many states, this became very, very popular in many states. Um, another innovation was something called the Australian ballot. It's hard to believe. But once upon a time, the vote was not, um, was not anonymous. Uh, you did not have a secret ballot. That was, that was an unusual thing. You would go into the, your, your polling place, and um, you would have a ballot for this, uh, for this particular party and a ballot for this particular party, and you'd choose one. And usually the uh, city boss, the guy who was running your uh, political machine in your city, was standing over there watching you uh, take whatever ballot that you wanted to take and vote the way, uh, you know, and, and was able to watch you voting. Uh, 
Um, so, so a lot of, uh, in fact, ultimately everybody is going to put into effect what's called the Australian ballot, or uh, better known in the United States as the secret ballot, where I take one ballot with a whole bunch of options on it, and I go into a booth and I vote on the things that I want to vote on without anybody seeing or knowing what I'm voting on. And this, again, this is a way of improving democracy. Nobody can intimidate me. Uh, nobody's watching me make my selections. Nobody can bribe me or, or kind of, um, you know, coerce me into voting the way they want, because it's all done in secret. Um, now, oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, one of the side effects on this is the idea that, well, wait a minute, do we really want everybody voting? Remember, the progressives at this time are really emphasizing um, efficiency and scientific management and things along those lines. And is it efficient to have people who are not necessarily educated or don't even necessarily care about politics and government voting? Uh, do you want the stupid people voting? So, um, so many progressives are going to say, no, we really don't. Uh, and in fact, what we want to do is we want to institute tests um, so that uh, so that people know how to read, or at, at least demonstrate some kind of knowledge of government and politics before they're allowed to vote. Uh, and you can imagine this became especially. Um, uh, you know, especially uh, popular in places where segregation was, uh, uh, you know, was in place. Uh, and of course, the people who were grading the tests were oftentimes the uh, racist white guys uh, who made sure that if you were a white guy, no matter how you did on the test, you were going to be able to vote. If you were black, no matter how well you did on the test, you were not going to vote. You were not going to pass the test. Um, so we were, we were going to put in uh, ways of, uh, of restricting the vote, or uh, the term that is used in restricting the vote is disfranchisement, um, taking away the franchise is your right to vote. Um, now, one of the most famous of the, uh, I should probably change this around, so you can talk about women's suffrage. During this time, there was a, there was a tremendous uh, um, you know, call for women's suffrage, and many states at this point, at the state level, are starting to put into effect uh, giving women the right to vote at the state or at the municipal level. Not at the national level yet, but states like Wisconsin and, uh, and many of your western states are actually going to give women the right to vote um, and recognize the right of women to vote. Again, they can't vote for president, but they can vote for governor and they can vote for state legislatures, uh, legislators and that kind of thing. Now, probably one of the most famous of these uh, state level and ultimately he will become a national level figure uh, is uh, Fighting Bob, uh, Robert Fighting Bob La Follette, probably the best head of hair in American history. Um, and he was a proponent of these democratic reforms and ultimately what became known as the Wisconsin idea. He was a Wisconsin uh, um, a politician, ultimately a Wisconsin senator, and uh, he's going to be an advocate for, what uh, for democracy, women's suffrage um, initiative, and uh, he's also going to be a huge advocate for uh, uh, laws that govern and regulate the, uh, the elite uh, members of society and the moneyed interest and kind of get more money into the hands of the little guy and leveling the playing field for the little guy. Uh, to this day, Wisconsin still celebrates what's called the Fighting Bob Fest every year. Uh, he was very, very popular, very, uh, you know, very powerful politician at that time. Uh, this idea of the Wisconsin idea was the idea that, hey, you know, not quite, not a socialist idea, but a pretty nice little moderate pro uh, progressive idea is, hey, Let's get all of the stakeholders who are involved in the economic functioning of the state. So investors, workers, laborers, um, you know, middle managers, and let's bring them all together and figure out how to uh, kind of the best way to run our state industries and to, and to make sure that everybody gets a little bit of a little piece of the pie. It also, again, kind of serves the, that, that progressive desire for that early progressive desire for efficiency and scientific management. So the, this becomes known as the, uh, the Wisconsin idea, bringing all the stakeholders together um, to, um, to look at regulating the economy. Um, Scientific management was another, uh, another process. The idea was is if, if we're producing more efficiently, then more people will, then there's more money to, that's going to be able to go around. Everybody will, be, will do a little bit better. Everybody will get a bigger piece of the pie. Um, Frederick Ta uh, Winslow Taylor was, of course, one of the founders of uh, the, this principle of scientific management. He is one of the, uh, the idea of bringing efficiency into the workplace. Unfortunately, this, this gets kind of carried away to a certain extent where uh, businesses then start regulating the number of bathroom breaks that you have or paying you based on your production. Uh, this is a, uh, it's hard to see in your, uh, uh, on this, but uh, maybe if you take a look at the notes a little bit better. What this is, is this is one of, uh, 
Taylor studies in which he's actually studying the movements of this of this industrial worker and uh, putting together some particular kind of component. And the goal, of course, was to study which were the most efficient movements um, to minimize the amount of time it takes to build a particular component. So if somebody's reaching for a part that's way over here and he has to reach for it all the time, maybe we should move that part here and make it and reduce the amount of movement that he's taking. And, and yes, it may only uh, save you about a second per component, but if you're making a thousand components, then that's a thousand seconds that it's going to save you, and you can make even more components in a shorter amount of time. So that's the idea of this, uh, these principles of scientific management. They were put into effect gleefully by uh, Henry Ford, who was the first person to uh, uh, to uh, popularize the moving um, the moving. Uh, uh, mass assembly line in which components come down a conveyor belt and uh, and workers uh, put together the uh, the components as they're coming down the conveyor belt and then by the you have a relatively cheap um, uh, you know and, and high quality uh, automobile um, uh, Henry Ford was also among the first to say hey maybe we should pay our, um, our our workers enough to actually be able to afford to buy one of our cars uh, so what we have there is if we pay them enough, then maybe they're going to be uh, loyal to the company and they're, they're going to stay and we get to keep their skills. And also, they're going to buy cars from Ford rather than go and buy cars from somebody else because that's where their bread and butter is. And sure enough, the, the system actually did work. Um, now, there was a down, some downsides to progressivism, the, the, the uh, progressivism of the early 20th century. Uh, did have some little bumps in the road, some ma in fact, some major bumps in the road, um, oftentimes addressed by modern progressives. One of the, for instance, civil rights. Um, the civil rights uh, movement was a part of the progressive movement. They wanted to equal the playing field for the little guy. Uh, they were concerned about economic injustice. They felt that the government should play a role in this. Um, they emphasized moral improvement, and they, they were also very interested in, in the idea of scientific management. But, um, but... You know, oftentimes when there was a negotiation between progressive groups and uh, and the state of progressive groups and corporations, oftentimes one of the first groups that was uh, that was kind of um, you know th that their back was turned on were the civil rights groups. Um, this was the uh, the neglected era of the progressive movement, um, and in fact, in some cases, the actual laws that were put into effect, the progressive laws, were actually kind of held against uh, and used against African Americans, especially for instance, the Mann Act. The Mann Act was a uh, a moral improvement um, piece of legislation that made it unlawful to bring uh, women across state lines for quote unquote immoral purposes, which of course means sex. The idea was to try to regulate and limit uh, prostitution, but what it had was a, a, an impact on just uh, you know even normal uh, you know boy girl relationships, such as the relationship between uh, heavyweight boxing champion Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight champion, and uh, and his girlfriend, who happened to be a white woman. Now uh, he, the, these were two uh, consenting adults, um, but uh, he was he he brought her across state lines and ended up getting arrested, put in jail. Um, well, why? Uh, he ultimately is going to end up marrying her. I mean, this was not like a, uh, a you know a, a, a libidinous relationship here. Um, they they were they were involved in a real relationship, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that he was a black heavyweight champion. Uh, so in essence, this was a black guy who made a living and made really good money beating up white people. Uh, so, so this is a, this is a real problem, and he was dating and having a relationship with a white woman, which of course is especially dangerous at this time. So the Man Act was actually used to kind of uh, take him down a peg. Um, um, the idea of eugenics, the idea that maybe some people just ought not have children, and uh, it might be uh, more efficient if we just stop poor people, especially from having any more children. Uh, and this was kind of presented as a way of, uh, of, of limiting the, uh, the effects of poverty. But at the same time, it was also a way of limiting the rights of women to have children. Uh, and in fact, a lot of women were sterilized. Now, men weren't, but women uh, were sterilized during this time against their will. If they were poor, uh, sometimes they would be uh, incarcerated and ultimately sterilized with having their, their, uh, their tube side or having hyster uh, hysterectomies done. And this was done all the way right up until the 1970s is the last case of, uh, in which this was done. So this was, a, uh, this was kind of common, and, and this was a eugenics project, which ultimately is going to be embraced by um, very unprogressive groups like the Nazis uh, in the 1930s. Um, disenfranchisement, we've already talked about, the, the idea of limiting 
um, you know, the people's right to vote. Uh, the temperance movement, the temperance movement was hugely successful. They even got a constitutional amendment making it illegal to, uh, to buy and sell alcohol in the United States, and what ended up happening as a result of that was the creation of basically a black market, an underground, um, uh, you know, underground cartels, namely the mafia, uh, that, that made their money through illegal activities of, uh, of sneaking alcohol into cities uh, and selling that alcohol illegally. Uh, so, so the likes of Al Capone and, and, and other uh, slime like that, uh, they're going to make lots and lots of money because of this temperance movement, very much uh, like we could say maybe a lot of drug dealers today make lots and lots of money just by virtue of the fact that their product is illegal. So either way, now, one of the things that, that, I, that we can say about the progressive movement is, in, in many cases, many of uh, when you take a look at progressivism today, they've addressed a lot of these things. Uh, progressives are you oftentimes at the forefront of, um, of making sure that, that that reforms are applied to civil rights. Um, uh, the I, you know the uh, the progressive movement is usually involved in um, in family planning now and and uh, uh, and the uh, the right of women to make choices about their reproductive uh, their reproductive health. Um, usually, it's the progressives who are out there right now fighting to uh, to you know guarantee access to the vote. And, and also, um, you, oftentimes it's progressives today who are actually taking a stand on maybe we should legalize marijuana and things along those lines. So, um, so though these were, were a component of progressivism in the past, uh, many of these have been kind of put along the wayside for progressives today. So anyway, that's the progressive movement uh, as it stands, uh, and we're going to talk about progressivism at the national level later on. Sorry this one was so long.